Hi there, everybody. I'm here today with Stuart Houghton, founder and CEO of Brightbox Group, and Steve Andrews, who's head of sales and marketing. Um, wanted to have a chat with Brightbox. Brightbox are one of our partners for the year at FinTech North. And I want to start by saying thank you to Brightbox Group. Um, you know, without their support, we wouldn't be able to continue doing the work that we do across the northern FinTech ecosystems, bringing everybody together, promoting the North as an international centre of excellence for FinTech. So, yeah, I want to start by saying thank you to Stuart and Steve for their support. Um, and I want to just get cracking, really, and, and ask a few questions to find out more about the business and, and see how we can leverage the FinTech North community to, uh, to make some real change and, and impact, uh, impact innovation across the North. So without further ado, um, Stuart, question for you then, sir. Um, so why did you start the business? Uh, and I suppose, you know, tell us your story, really. I, I, I want to know more. Good. Well, hopefully everyone that's listening has got at least an hour set aside just for this, this, this first question. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's important to sort of start back where my career began, because I think all of that leads to ultimately why Brightbox is who it is today. Uh, but I spent 16 years with Accenture first, um, management consulting across technology, um, but across financial services, uh, retail, uh, and then ended up in the public sector for the last four years of that journey. Uh, but left there, <clears throat> Accenture was a, was a great place to be, but you, you kind of work out whether it's somewhere where you want to continue your, your career or actually whether you want to go off and, and try your hand at something yourself. And it was very much the latter that I was after. So with a, another ex-Accenture partner, a chap called Neville Roberts, we, we co-founded what is now a fintech, so a company called Planix that is coming up to about 10 and a half years old. Um, and that has a product suite that focuses on intraday liquidity and helping financial institutions, corporates and other FIs basically deal with that intraday liquidity challenge and being able to report on that against the regulations in, in a very near real time fashion. Um, and Planix went and continues to go from strength to strength. But about five years ago, so halfway through that journey, um, I guess we were looking for a partner ourselves to help us on our resourcing challenges. Um, and certainly if you've worked in a big corporate like Accenture, generally, if you wanna get resource, you know what you're getting, it comes quickly and it kind of comes all pre-screened, pre-vetted and all of those good things. And we were missing that in our own business. Um, and, and it wasn't only us, it was some of our own clients that we were working with that were having the same challenge. Um, and so that was really when sort of Brightbox was, was born. Um, and for the first couple of years, it was really about us connecting people in our network with our own business, but actually with other clients that we were working with as well. And that continued to grow. Uh, and about three years ago, we then decided uh, as a board to, to basically create Brightbox formally um, and, and set it off on its merry way. And that's when I became CEO proper of the organization and really went on a bit of a journey to work out what it was that we really wanted to be. Um, and for me, it boils down to two things. One is, is how do we be a resourcing consultant for our clients? So how do we help them understand the challenges um, that, that not only have they been through, but we have been through firsthand as well? And, and what are the answers to try to solve those resourcing challenges? But then actually to deliver the capability for them to solve those challenges. So how do we help them find good resource, not only in the UK, but actually on a nearshore basis, and more recently, we've now starting to open up offshore as well, to really become that kind of um, one organization that can ride the journey with a client on, on that resourcing challenge. And of course, with the heritage of Planix, FinTech, I guess, has always been in, in the background for me as a, as a space that I've always had a vested interest in. And you'll certainly see by some of the clients that we now work with, like Bankify, Cardio, uh, Exizent is another one. The, all of these sort of new startups that are coming through that have those challenges and we're helping them um, on, on that journey. So yeah, it's a, it's a vision to be a, a, a real long-term partner with our clients in that space. Brilliant, yeah, thank you for that. Um, on to my next question then. So you mentioned some of your fantastic clients there. What issues generally are, are you trying to solve, I suppose? I suppose it's um, you know, been seen as that resourcing consultant. Are there any other challenges that your clients face that you, that you help them out with in a sort of specialised way? So it's, and I would probably boil it, boil it down to four elements. It's, it is being that consultant. So it's actually being able to, to sit there, having worn the T-shirt and got the scars from, from, from being through similar journeys to what they're going through, and being able to bring to bear what we're doing creatively and innovatively with our other clients to see if that is something that they want to 
uh, work with us on in terms of getting that resource into their business to help them deliver against those type timelines. We all know that obviously fintech is a highly in investable, if that's such a word, um, area. And, and, you know, investors have high expectations of delivery and, and commitments from those organizations. And again, we, we know what it's like to have gone through that. So I think having having a partner like us sat alongside you being an being as much as we can be an extension to your business when it comes down to finding the right people i think is fundamentally important um and is a real issue i think a lot of fintechs certainly don't have access to and i think having the best capabilities available then to deliver against those challenges so we are constantly uh, moving around the market looking for partners that we want to work with that we know can ultimately deliver um for our end clients and again, I think having that trust, trust is a huge thing when it comes to resourcing. I, I myself have been, and I know Steve has as well, on the other side where you're looking for resources, you know, you're, 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 you're getting loads of CVs come through and it's just being able to see the wood for the trees in terms of what's right for you as a business and ultimately what fits. And I think really importantly, I think one of the challenges from, a, from on the buying side is ultimately having someone that will ride the rough with the smooth. So when it's when it's going well, it's all good. But actually, it's the tough times, I think, where we really earn our corn. That might mean that actually some of our business is dialed down as a result of that. But in my mind, that's that's just part of that journey that you've got to go on with, with that client and, and be vested in where they're heading as an organization. Steve, did you want to come in there? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think Stu was, you know, touching on some points there where speed and, and, and flexibility, uh, you know, two key words there, um, you know, speed to actually turn around and, and help, you know, quickly. We, we're able to be pretty, um, can mobilise our team and our resources pretty quickly. And then flexibility, you know, we, we both in the UK and with our nearshore partners are building up um you know, resources that will allow firms to, you know, if they, they do need to scale up quite quickly, you know, whether that's for a project or for, you know, had, um, you know, new piece of work come in and, and, and quickly they, they need to be able to deliver it. You know, we're, we're a partner that can help them achieve that. Um, that's, that is pretty critical. We, we talked on, you know, we're, we're anything to do with technology needs to move quickly. And the, the, unfortunately, it, it's not always that easy when it comes to humans and resources uh, and, and accessibility. So that's a big USP for us is being able to have, um, you know, a good pool of resource both here in the UK and then, you know, significantly increasing across uh, across Europe. And, and then, as Stuart alluded to before, we're, we've now just brought on a, an offshore partner uh, as well. So, um you know, that that big resource pool is is essential for, for flexibility um, and and having partners who are able to meet our standards and our requirements that uh, allow us to you know scale up the right people quickly uh, but then also the flexibility to scale back down um, you know it does work work both ways I think the, the one thing I'd add Joe is the <clears throat> obviously the last eighteen months I think has been a huge challenge um, in many guises for, for a, a lot of companies, organizations, people, individuals. Um, but I think it's also presented, you know, some form of opportunity and it's forced an awful lot of companies to look at how they embrace that whole remote working model. And, you know, certainly from my old days, and even I was probably slightly in this space, which is, you know, very much everyone had to be in the office. I wanted to see them there and, and, yeah. and kind of, work with them and, and hear the, the the chatter around around what's going on but the last 18 months has forced us to shift that model wholly and, and completely and what we're seeing is is a lot of clients are moving away from the, the term we use is location-based resourcing so wherever your head office is they tended to, to recruit people in and around that space yeah. now they've gone skills led so find me the right skills get me the right technologies the experiences and to a certain extent, I don't care where they are. So for an awful lot of clients now, you know, resourcing for us is UK wide, full stop, end of. Um, and I would hazard a guess that that's the same for most other organizations who are in a similar space. But it's going way beyond that now. You know, companies are embracing Europe um, like, like, like they're on their doorstep. And I think that's great um, for, 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 for technology, for resourcing and for bringing 
other experiences and knowledge to bear that previously you might not have been able to get hold of. No, that, thank you for that. And just on that last point, um, you know, do you see that as an opportunity for the North then, Stuart? Oh, I do. So the, as, a, as, a, as a good thing for the North, that, I, you know, the removal of those geographical barriers. I do. And I, and I, and I, we're funny enough, I was talking to a client about it the other day and, you know, historically London, you know, for whatever reason had the aura of being the place to be. Um, and I think that's fundamentally broken away. Uh, I think we'll see salaries shift and equalize more. Um, and, and I think, you know, having someone working, the, the great thing is, is that I think done properly, it really brings to home, brings to life that whole work life balance challenge that has been there historically. And so if you want to live, you know, in the outer Hebrides or whatever, that's fine. And, and, you know, as long as you've got a decent internet connection and ultimately you can deliver on what you've got to do, then I think that's great. So I, I think, I think we'll see a lot more of an equalization happen across the country. And, you know, there were tech hubs growing up everywhere. I think they'll still exist, but I think what you'll find is, is that footprints and Manchester's footprint will widen a bit. And actually the notion of the Northern corridor and all of that kind of stuff will ultimately blend and become more apparent. Um, so I think personally, I think we're in a really exciting time with regards to resourcing. I don't think it's settled down yet. I don't think people and organizations have found kind of what that, I know it's cliche, but the new norm looks like. But I think it's up to all of us to, to help everyone get into that new space and, and see where it takes us all. I think one of the one of the challenges with a lot of newcomers, they you know, culture is very important and you know they've been able to control a bit more of the culture because within one. Um, you know, one building, for example. So going on that journey and what does a hybrid model look like and what's the impact on that is something we, we've you know, got a lot of experience. You know, our clients use us in different ways. So some, you know, use a number of services, some maybe only use a couple, but they've all, they all want to create a great place to work. So what does that, what does that look like when it's, you know, some people are in the office, some people are, you know, in London, in the Southwest, in Scotland, some people are in, in Europe, how do you retain that? So there is a journey that we go on with our, um, with our customers and our partners. Um, that is essential, especially for um, businesses who want to grow, um, businesses that uh, have got maybe core products with it within their, their suite. So it's essential that that culture comes through in, in the work they do and the services they deliver. So that is, that is really important for us. Um, and we will continue to do that. And that, I think, that, that's often, you know, in, in the first or second real important factor when companies are, are going to use other partners or maybe changing tact a little bit that they don't deviate from this kind of vision. It is going to still, the outcome might be the same. It's just maybe shaped slightly differently. Um, but, but say, having experience of having lots of different types of customers, you know, they, they don't all have to be certainly fintechs and, uh, and sure techs, but different you know older businesses more incumbents who are who are evolving as well we're helping them go on that journey which is you know often an even more difficult journey um so i think bringing those experiences are, are, are hugely valuable um for companies absolutely i'd, I'd, I'd echo everything you've, you've both said there um and just on that note then and this kind of brings me on to my next question i suppose you know part of the i mean i know we're fintech north and we we like to champion Northern FinTech and talk about FinTech at our, our events, but, you know, a good chunk of our community, a good proportion, um, you know, come from the financial services sector, you know, banks, building societies, credit unions, organisations such as that. So that kind of brings me on to my next question, really. Um, you know, what could the FinTech North community do to help, I suppose, or, you know, what could they get involved with? And, and, and I suppose maybe an extension of that question, if you want to answer this one as well, is, you know, who are you looking to meet within the FinTech North community, basically? So I, I, there were, I mean, the, the latter question, anyone that's got a resourcing challenge or, or wants to just talk about that resourcing challenge. So it, it's, it's quite interesting, you know, so at the end of the day, we're a business, right? And, and we need to get working to, to, to continue to grow and all of that kind of good stuff. But it is, I believe it's really important to share our own experiences and, and what we're going through. And, and like I said earlier, we've no, no one knows yet, I think, what the, what the next 12 or 18 months is going to shape up for us all. Um, but the, needless to say, there'll be some organisations out there that believe they, they, they've cracked the nut or are doing a good job. 
let's share that and and bring that to the fore because I think um, and it might be an idea for something that we maybe do with some of your members in the future, Joe. Is is how do we share that new best practice and and to a certain extent as well what hasn't worked. So you know, for example, one of the things we've been through is is trying to get our heads around how we're going to make meetings work. What we find is is if everyone is in the same location, whether that be in the room or everyone's remote, they they kind of work okay. But when you start to get some people in a room and some people remote, there's different dynamics that you probably previously didn't realize were there. Um, and, and so I think sh meeting other fintechs to talk about those experiences would be great. And if that's over a coffee and stuff, up for doing that. But of course, at the end of the day, helping uh, fintechs and shortechs on that resourcing journey uh, and bringing to bear some of the options and the tools, I guess, in our kit bag to help them. It is always great. And, and that doesn't mean that we have to get business today. It can be in six months or 12 months time. The point is, is that we're there to, to be called upon as and when those situations arise. I think, you know, we talked about team augmentation or certain complete teams. It, they're often different things and, and people need, you know, assistance on that. You know, that sometimes it's a, it's a step into a brave new world for, for a, lot of, mm. a lot of companies. So they, they really need to understand that. And it's, you know, often where they're on their own, it's a huge leap of faith. Whereas if they've got a partner who, who can help them through that entire journey, um, that that's pretty pretty essential. But and you know, we hope from from experience as well, we've learned that it's far more successful. And you, you know, you can actually gradually. Most of our partners have started, you know, with, with a couple of our services, and as we've grown, they've. They've grown, they've maybe brought out new products, they've got external investment, which is very uh, apt for the certainly the fintech community. At those certain points along their timeline and journey, they need us for different things. So we're, we're there when, we're, uh, when we need them or when they need us. And the other thing is about more of kind of that short, medium, long-term planning. So some of the things which we, we do with some of our partners is they, they may have strategic decisions they need to make around what technology stacks they may need to use. So what, what is the resource pool look like? What is the cost involved in that? You know, do I go that way? Do I go that way? So, you know, we, we, we often provide some consulting services going in and, and writing papers and really helping support some really key decisions that are going to uh, really, you know, that for the next two or three years have a huge impact. You know, if you go down one, tech stack route but then you can't get anyone to work it, it, it that, that, you know that's not great so we can really help inform give our uh, you know we've got the finger on on the market um and i think one of the things i mean i've been as you know been involved with with financial services and technology most of my career and that skill shortage is is uh, unfortunately because we've been such an attractive sector over the past four or five years is getting worse and worse mm -hmm. even in the Khalifa review it was it was you know um you know highly pointed out that we, we've got a big skill shortage to, to 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 bridge so it's going to be a journey it's not like we're saying suddenly everything's going to ship overseas it's going to be a, a combined effort so it might be that you're getting senior people in remote locations who are helping train up more locally uh, based people you know rather than thinking you've got to get someone senior right here so there's lots of different ways to do it um but it's, it's having those options and it's having a, you know, a partner and an expert like ourselves to really help them on that journey um, and training programs, uh, I think, you know, will, will increase. And I think there's, there's definitely a, a you know, desire to do that, but it's going to take time. You know, it, it's not going to be an overnight fix. And these businesses still need to establish themselves to grow to, to in, in most cases capture capture market share while they've got yeah. an audience you know so it's quite a rapid growth so how do we get through that as well as you know building out you know whether it's a, uh, a skills base more locally um but all those slightly different shapes you know we we have partners who are all different type uh, stages of their different timelines and their journey so uh, we can definitely assist yeah, and just just add to that, the, no, no business is no small or too big. So, you know, we work, one of our clients is a three-man business and we're helping them with some short-term demand um, requirements that they have. Other clients are, you know, tens of thousands strong. Um, so, and, and we've got experience of, of working in both extreme sets of environments and anything in the middle. Um, so, you know, again, don't, don't sort of, if, if you're out there thinking through, I've got these challenges, but am I too small? 
no, you know, let, let's talk. And, 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 you know, at the end of the day, if we, if we can't help you out, we probably know someone that can. Um, and I think that's quite important as well. It's how that ecosystem helps itself. Definitely, Steve. I'd, I'd like to echo that. I think the, the northern ecosystem, especially, um, it's really collaborative, isn't mm -hmm. it? So yeah, absolutely. Love to love to spread the word a little bit about um, about Brightbox, and hopefully those in the community can can come forward and reach out with with issues and, and have a chat with you. I suppose. Um, final question, then, gentlemen. Um, you know, I'm, I'm I'm sure that you can both rely on your your fintech backgrounds to answer this one. Um, mm -hmm. It's time to get a little bit geeky with it, I suppose, but. What for you are the most interesting elements of fintech and how do you see them developing over the next few years? Um, Stuart, I guess we'll start with you, if that's OK. Yeah. So and Steve probably is a, is a little bit more in, ensconced in some of these areas. But I guess I think with uh, it's the whole digital experience that, that uh, customers are going through. And I think one of the huge pieces of work and I think the, the what we've been through over the last 18 months has just formed a catalyst for this is how the traditional banks and financial institutions take their legacy systems, some of which are still mainframe, and, and attach those and, and integrate them with what's coming through from the fintechs and what they're bringing to the party. There's some serious, seriously exciting, innovative products out there that are leveraging sort of leading edge AI automation um, and obviously all of the open banking um, uh, stuff that's out there. And it's how those legacy guys basically keep up with, with the new ones. But equally, I think the new uh, challenger fintechs need the legacy uh, FIs because they've got the customer base and, and, and the loyalty. Um, and, you know, there's still a generation out there, I think, that are very much still wedded to being part of a large, big financial institution. Um, and ultimately, how do we bring those along with us? So, yeah, I think there's a a huge, I think, yeah, really exciting time in all of that space. And if you look at some of the numbers, you know, Innovate Finance said in 2020, $44 billion was invested in fintech across over 3,000 deals. Over 4 billion of that was done in the UK alone. So there's still huge amounts of money pouring into fintech. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's hugely exciting. The, 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 my last comment on this one would be, I, I read something the other day and it was in the past, Digital adoption has been hindered by generational divides, but the pandemic has been a great equalizer. And I think that just summarizes where we're at right now. We're on this journey of, of rebalancing everything. Um, and I think it's going to be exciting to see where it, where it, where it heads over the next 12, 18 months. Um, yeah, from me, I think we've gone through a few phases of, of open banking and early fintech propositions that have, that have come out and, you know, many have failed. That, that's, that's just the, the norm. And we're now going through different incarnations. We're probably in the, the period of payments at the moment where, you know, a lot of payments technology, um, open payments and, and you know, the clients of this world, Stripes, um, uh, it's their time and that's exploding. And I think moving forward, you've now got open finance, which... Um, you know, if they can really have the consumer at the heart of those propositions, some really uh, innovative uh, propositions, which is going to help, you know, the, the man on the street as much as the, uh, the high net worth person be able to control um, their financial lives. I think that's going to bring huge benefits, you know, some of the things like pensions, dashboards and stuff are taking years. So what does this next generation, how does it, as Stuart talks about, AI, machine learning really bring to that party. Um, there's some very exciting things out there. You know, we've certainly seen uh, the rise of the, 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 the online mortgage uh, brokers like Mojo of this world who, who've done some fantastic things. How's that then combining with all these other services to create this open finance ecosystem? Um, you know, there's just huge opportunities there. Couldn't agree more. Steve, Stuart, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for, thanks for taking the time to speak with me. Um, yeah, and I'll be sure to share the interview and, uh, and put the new story on, on the website and share it with the community. So yeah, thank you for your time. Good. Thanks, thanks Joe. Joe.